Hello, friends, old and new. Welcome to the Relative Roads podcast. I'm glad you're here. I haven't recorded anything for a couple of weeks, and I have some things to share with you. Before we get into the details of this episode, there are some things that have been on my mind and some incidences that have happened I'd, I'd also like to share. Some stories. Story time. Okay, let's start with the first one. Um, I should preface this, though. I've been getting more and more into politics, American politics, and it's merely for the sake of entertainment, mostly, but, you know, you can't help but learn things uh, as as you go. Um, picking a side of the fence is, is part of that process, or so it seems. I still have yet to pick a side of the fence, but I resonate with sensibility. And I find that on all sides. There are people who are anti-Trumpers that make all the sense in the world. There are people who are Trump 2020 who also make sense. And I find that the label of centrist actually makes the most sense to me. But I'm still as ignorant as, uh, you know, as anybody else who hasn't done a lot of research. So... I'm, I, I consider myself a, a student of American politics. And in this process, I've had conversations with people about things that, I don't know, I guess would be uh, not always appropriate for <laughs> a workplace conversation. But um, I, I have a niche with people that um, people generally feel comfortable with me and will share information. And uh, I, I don't want to take advantage of them but you know I, I learn a lot about people and, and one conversation in particular I asked a gentleman what his position was on Trump and boy he lit up like a Christmas tree and not in a good way he was infuriated by the anger and animosity he had in his heart for just that name alone and, and his beliefs about what that stands for and and kudos to him for being so passionate about that. But when I opened that conversation, I was, I don't know, I was looking forward to kind of exchanging ideas and sharing theories and saying, well, this is, I think this way, this is this way. And, but I kind of got, I kind of got blown out of proportion. Um, me, I, I was not in the conversation anymore. It was really about uh, what, what his perspective was and that's fine like in terms of being educated about people this was definitely a learning moment and you know I I don't have a problem with with either side you can like Trump and fine you can hate Trump and also fine but I feel like in most cases people have they have like some of this stuff is bottled up and it's it's pretty well known that that these are very tricky conversations to have with people. It's it's split family members, you know, apart. And uh, what a shame. What a shame that we can't just live and let live, you know, in some cases. Um, but if I were to offer advice to anybody who is interested in learning about politics, especially right now when it's so colorful, um, just tread lightly be open, open-minded, and ultimately be a good friend. Just listen. Because a lot of people have sort of just kept things to themselves and they're maybe not 100% sure about how they feel, but they haven't got a chance to express it. So I think in most cases, well, in a lot of cases, that people just need somewhere to air it out, to kind of you know, throw it against the wall and look at it and you can be that wall for them. And as long as you don't try and, I don't know, manipulate the conversation so that they buy into your idealisms, then it, it should be a very great learning experience. And I think ultimately people appreciate anyone who's willing to listen as they test these theories and say things out loud and kind of bounce ideas around. And that's one thing that I've learned in my adventure through politics so far is that you know people just they have a lot on their mind and they want to 
They want to talk about it, but it doesn't feel safe. I mean, there have been times when I've I've not really offered up my opinion because it's not safe. I don't want to taint a relationship because I know that it will. And, you know, it's real easy to misunderstand each other and then walk away with that frustration in your heart. And, I mean, that stuff seeps out when you don't even know it. So just be careful, you know, and and I'm trying to take my own advice because I have walked into a situation where I left feeling sort of hopeless and empty and it it didn't seem to be a very positive experience but I did learn a lot and this is this is really the the crux of what I've come across is just be kind to each other and be open-minded and just hear each other out I think that's the best advice I can offer up for anybody who's looking otherwise if you're not interested, then don't worry about it. It's all good. I'm, I don't hate you for it. If you feel like politics are, are just too crazy and you don't want to be involved, then that is your choice. And I'm not going to tell you that, that you're any less of an intellectual for it or any less of a person or citizen of the country. Um, you know, you'll, you'll come across your own challenges and, and you'll figure out what, what brought those on. And I think for me to understand politics to some degree, it helps me kind of understand the world I live in a little bit more. And I don't know, mostly it's, it's good for me to know when things come up in conversation, like a podcast, and I can have, you know, solid references to have a good conversation and, and keep it entertaining. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was the, the thing with politics, but... Let's you know what this is still this still has to do with politics but I had an experience that kind of made me realize that politics are not just with government. Um I don't know if why I needed to live through an example for that uh, recognition but I did and I'll I'll share that story with you. About a week ago I had to uh make a delivery to a location that I I had been to before but never had any issues so that's not true. I did have an issue and I did speak with my, my boss about it and sort of got a green light to approach it differently upon my next delivery. And that's where the story began was I I, I was making this delivery and I kind of knew that the guy was going to ask me to do more than was expected. And you know, quite frankly, with as many stops as I have in a day, I'm trying to cut some of that time out so I can get home and produce a podcast, for crying out loud, and do other things like pick up my child. That's always nice. Um, from school, not pick him up physically because he's heavy now. He's 10 years old. But anyways, so when I go in here and he, you know, makes the request, I'm like, um, yeah. Well, I, I kind of need to go. And so, and then he cuts me off. He says, well, if, uh, if you don't want to do it, then just take it back. Cause I don't want it. And I just, I'm like, this is the part that's tricky because I knew this was a possibility. I did. I knew this was a possibility. And yet when it hit me, when his words hit me, it was still like a shock. It was like, wow, he really did go there. And so, you know, I responded uh, like, really, that's that's how this is going to be handled. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And then he starts throwing his weight around about who he knows and what he can do. And and I'm kind of like in this weird position where I'm like, I'm going to call for help. So so I called for help and that help didn't turn out to be much help at all. In fact, I was put in a position to sort of, I don't know, be humiliated and perform the job that he originally asked me to do and walk out with my tail between my legs. And uh, it was humiliating. And it, it, it sort of broke some trust uh, with me and, uh, and work. But it did teach me about politics and that unfortunately in the world we live in money 
is a great manipulator. And those who don't have money are, we're the pawns. We're the pawns on the chessboard. And I think that is a, a profound thing to understand is that, yeah, you, you're enjoying your American life and you're, you're enjoying the freedoms in America. But I think the idea is to strive for ownership of how you make your money. And, you know, this is really a shout out to entrepreneurship. And, you know, if if you ignore politics because you're you're so focused on getting yourself in a position so you don't work for anybody, by all means, my friends, do that, because I think it is the ultimate freedom. And that is another profound thing about politics is uh, you kind of want to be the one at the top. <laughs> So you don't have to walk out of a store with your tail between your legs. But anyways, I don't feel sorry for me. I'm I'm a grateful student of life, and I am lucky that I get to do all the things I do, including my day job. I am I'm grateful that I have it, and it, it gives me freedoms that uh, other jobs haven't. And so uh, we'll go with that. I'm still good. I hope you're good. Now, about this episode. This is my friend Corinne Metters. She is the one of the most talented actresses in Sacramento. Hands down. I'm not just saying that. I truly believe it. And I am picky with Sacramento actors. I really am. I, I'm I'm kind of a prima donna in that sense that it's it's hard to hard to please me. I I really it has to be believable. I mean, come on. Come on, people. Get your act together. Literally. And Corinne is really good at that. She's also a classically trained singer. Um, I mean, she can do it all, man. And she is also not just some, some uh, you know, uh, she's not just some, uh, you know, weak little uh, actress. She's actually from the East Coast, you know. She's from, uh, she's from the East Coast of the USA. So she's coming at you hard. With, like, life experiences and stuff. Anyways, uh, we get into everything about acting, um, but also acting as uh, as a full-time parent and what that means to our career. And also, um, when we get into uh, white privilege, because I ask specifically. You know, that's another thing. I, I, I've made it a point to sort of steer away from questions that are directly related to race because I think I think we make it about it and it doesn't go away unless we stop bringing it up and uh, I think unless somebody else needs to air something out I don't really feel the need to single that out anymore um, anyways we talk about uh, so many things I actually forgotten I, I listened to it the other day and meant to take notes but I didn't and here I am but if you know Corinne you know she has got a wealth of information to share she's got a heart of gold and you'll love her I I promise you'll love her without further ado Corinne Metters enjoy I'm just a wandering nomad out on the interstate Good. Cozy. Yeah. This is when you when you're doing voiceover, when you're doing the movie trailer style of voice. Yeah. It gets as close to the mic as possible. Yes. You know. Yeah. I have, yeah, it's funny cuz every time I don't I sometimes set up in my closet to do like try to reduce the sound <laughs> and I get carried away in there and I'll just end up playing on the audio for a while and then deleting everything cuz I'm just goofing off, you know. But you get you get used to, you know, mic technique. Yeah, and then there's mouth noise, which I hate. You know, we, we, where it's like I call it lip smacking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm the, we're not being recorded now, are we? Yes, we are. 
<laughs> so if you like, you're talking about when you when the lips peel apart, and mm-hmm. what, yeah, it's when your mouth is dry, and um, you there's these little like bubbles and sounds, and I remember watching some videos of Bob Ross. <laughs> you know, he's there painting away, and he had this like, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's called mouth noise in the voiceover world. It's amphibious. <laughs> it's what it sounds like a slimy critter, which is not pleasing. <laughs> but um okay, so we're on. Okay, cool. Well welcome. Thank you. Corinne. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Yeah. So you've done a podcast before. I have. What was that for? It was called the Actors Lounge. And oh. um Melanie, who runs the Actors Lounge, she has on um, her Instagram account, um, I mean, it's literally over 100 podcasts at, at this point. But she interviews people who are not only actors, but other influencers in the acting community. Sure. And she's out of the Bay Area. Oh, okay. But, um, but that was about mm, about six months ago. Yeah. I did that one. But. You've been doing full-time acting for a while, right? Yeah. It's been a full-time pursuit. You yeah. know, I balance that with um, raising my family. Of which course. Which is, you know, number one. Sure. But it's consistently on my mind, and you're working even when you're just sitting there idling and you're thinking about things. It's just a lot of, okay, what do I need to do now um, for that day? Yeah. And then there's what I would like to see happen, Mm -hmm. and then you take the steps to achieve those goals, you know, and then that's when you're idling. It's just, it's almost like you're obsessing over it. Yeah. And then there's getting in your car, going to auditions. You know, I drive down to the Bay Area. Right. Uh, if it's not that, then you're actually working on becoming a better actor. So you're attending workshops. I actually attended one yesterday yeah. with Kirk Baltz, and he's from L.A. And um, people, if they are huge fans of Quentin Tarantino, they know him as Officer Nash in Reservoir Dogs. Okay. And yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've seen that movie or not, but I have. It's been some time, but I that once I see it, I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. yeah. It's that the scene where uh, Officer Nash gets his ear cut off. Oh, that's him. That's him. Interesting. So he's been up to Sacramento several times. Yeah. To give these Meisner-based workshops, which where you really dig in and. You just allow yourself to be as vulnerable as you can be. Yeah. Um, you're given some work to memorize to a degree, you know, in the form of a monologue. And it's not so much uh, learning the text as it is learning your about yourself. Of course. And personalizations and bringing that to light as you're delivering some aspect or some gist of the text. Sure. So that was yesterday from 10 to 6 at the Wilkerson Theater. Spent the whole day digging in like that. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, what a great day of therapy. Yeah, (laughs) it has its side of therapy too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the the playfulness and the the vulnerability give you a great opportunity to grow through some some stuff that is just floating around in there. Yeah. And I I honestly think that... uh, if improv could be worked into a lot of work settings, people would be better off for it. Just taking time out to do some kind of improv-based work? Just to or? access that imagination mm-hmm. and your playfulness. Mm-hmm. I think those things are great when you're when you're stuck in a building all day with people. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, I just think there's a healthy psychological benefit to mm-hmm. it. You know, and in with in terms of the uh, obsession, um, I mean, there's a reason why you love it. You know, mm-hmm. and you, yeah, it's anything creative. I think you're you just you get going, and it's hard to stop that thought process. It doesn't go away. No, you're yeah. kind of a slave to it in a sense, but willingly so. Yeah. You know, as far as um, just some kind of creative expression and being involved in a workplace environment I think that's you brought up a really great point I haven't 
been a part of a corporate culture, so to speak, for well over a decade. And uh, that's actually where I met my husband Mm -hmm. was when I got my first quote unquote real job. And I was chained to a desk, you know, and I, I had a headset on and I had I was required to to sell cord blood banking <laughs> for a biotech company. Wow. And you know, it was a very demanding job in a sense, you know, it was some somewhat of a boiler room environment, sure. but you know, I was a singer at that point. Yeah. I was going to rehearsals at night singing with the Lyric Opera Company in San Francisco. And I also had a voice coach, and we were preparing, and we were doing recitals together. And uh, but going during the day, it's kind of like stifled. All of that is stifled. Yeah, yeah. And what's what I did realize back then, and this was what two thousand four, two thousand five. Yeah. Just as just as YouTube and the internet <clears throat> and social media was, I mean, Facebook wasn't even. It was something. Yeah on the Harvard campus. Sure. But it wasn't something that was readily available to everyone. So it's kind of like a pre Facebook social media. Right. Different so time. YouTube. And uh what I remember we would get up from our cubicles and we would kind of like stand around somebody's desk yeah. looking at the computer because they found a really, really funny video. Yeah. And so everyone was laughing at what we were coming across on the internet back then. It was like, this is so much fun. And it was kind of the beginning of, okay, people expressing themselves, being funny, and it sort of translated into our work environment. We would share a video right. <laughs> to one another and you kind of look over your cubicle and you could see somebody, oh, they're they're watching it now yeah, and they're yeah. cracking up yeah. and... But that's all that we had, you know, but there was definitely this wanting for people individually wanting to share. Yeah. So I haven't been in a work environment like that since. So I don't even know what it's like now. Yeah. I hope that it's something that's, you know, it's fun for people that they enjoy going to work. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it kind of takes... Back when movies used to be released, you know, we would only find out more about the movie when you'd go to work and you'd talk to friends about the movie. And and now it's just a flood of uh, creative artwork online. Mm-hmm. And so who knows what's trending in what cubicle? There are so many things, so many things <laughs> to watch. Did you, when you watched that, is that what kind of inspired you to get into acting? You said you were singing at the time. <clears throat> Well, the acting came about much earlier in my life. Um, Both of my parents are actors. You know, they have the creative spirit. My dad, primarily a teacher of languages, and he's also uh, an an audio engineer. And my mom, stay-at-home mom. I'm one of five kids. But they met in college when they were both in A Man for All Seasons um, as actors. And then they also co-directed musicals when I was a kid. Oh, wow. So my first experience was, I would tell people, is through exposure. And then after that, um, I was in The King and I as one of the royal children. And I was nine years old. And so singing and acting has always been a big part of my life. Yeah. Ever since, all through high school and to college, um, my background in college, I have a degree in art history, but also music and theater um, as kind of like a, a, a backup to that. Yeah. Constantly doing theater in the summer and then singing with local organizations, either choirs or small ensembles as a chorister or even a soloist. And then focusing on formal training with that. I mean, it just, there's a whole history. Sure, yeah. You know, I even pound the pavement in New York City in my 20s, pursuing an acting career. Oh, wow. And I completely failed at it because I didn't have a mentor. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. I had an agent, you know, I had been on some auditions, but I just hadn't dialed it in yet. How long were you there before? Five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. I've had another friend go through the same experience and and end up feeling very isolated and 
I don't know. I just hear it's really tough. New it's, York's tough. New York's tough. I loved it. I love New York City. I mean, I'm from the East Coast, born and raised, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's like a whole other conversation. Sure. That I could ramble on about. Sure. But, uh, but uh, I love New York, you know? I love New Yorkers. Yeah. I loved being there. I love the energy. I love the vibe. And this was in the 1990s. So, yeah. you know, if anything, there was occasional person with a cell phone walking on the street sure but we didn't have the internet as we know it at all yeah and so your means to an end was trying to find some kind of work that would sustain you which for me that was my biggest challenge which ultimately led to my demise of that whole experience because i couldn't afford to be there yeah um and then it's just exploring so people are out doing things right. a lot. You know, I went to see a lot of live theater. I also belong to a small theater ensemble. We did a lot of experimental stuff um, just to kind of get a feel for who am I? What am yeah. I doing? Um, and I think for me, that was the beginning of, okay, this is the life, you know, when you've decided to adopt a creative existence and and that and that alone that was my exposure to that kind of that kind of life and i loved it yeah i was actually thinking about it on the way over here oh, really? because a song came on the radio that triggered a lot of memories yeah and um the verve bittersweet symphony that was a really big popular like a popular song back then yes I remember. um but yeah it was during that time and so um, a lot of movies. And then also during that time, I had my first experience being a part of an independent film called Scattered Limbs of the Dead Poet. And the subject matter was pretty heavy. But what I loved about it was the director, his name is John Vincent Vargas. And he was on the internet. He had a website for it. And so he's out there. I'm not even sure if he's making movies anymore. Mm -hmm. I'd love to touch base with him. How's it going, man? What you up to these days? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but at that, during that um, time, the, he was so driven and you, it, nothing was digital. So if you're out to shoot a movie, that's all on film. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to people like Danny Boyle, um, Train Spotting was a very popular movie back then. Mm -hmm. And it was a low budget film. And it inspired a lot of friends of mine who are working in film at that time to, okay, I think I want to start making movies on my own with what I have. But finding cameras and people being able to operate them and using film was not easy to come by and so you had to be extremely performance ready in order to be on sets that yeah. involved you know that that limited form of technology at sure. that time mm -hmm. versus now it's so lax you right. can and it's so easy yeah and, and um, affordable um, and affordable it's like every, it seems like everybody is a filmmaker now it's yeah. true it's <laughs> true everybody is a performer of sorts yeah. so um so yeah then that was my exposure to film and then it's just been off and on ever since um i didn't decide to become full-on actor until uh 2014 uh, I decided it was time sure. that I was ready to kind yeah. of get back into doing what I was doing before I got married and had kids. Yeah. And and I haven't looked back. Good you for know. you. Yeah, good for you. I'm happy for you. <laughs> Thanks. That's pretty keep awesome. Plowing through it. <laughs> sure. Well, it's great to have a partner that that helps uh, facilitate that opportunity. Yeah. We. I mean, we have. My husband works from home, and so and he travels a lot. So if anything, we're trying to work out each other's schedules. Mm -hmm. Like, are you going to be out of town? Are you going to be out of town? Because we're trying to figure out. Okay, who's going to mind the kids and 
they're old enough now where they're independent mm-hmm. and it's just going to continue to sure. get more and more, you know, they'll get their independence more and more self-sufficient. How old are they? My son is 12. My daughter's 11. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Good. That's excellent. Yeah. How exciting. <clears throat> and they, you know, they're really great. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of in their own worlds now. They are. Uh, I realize that the nine ten transition, they start to show some some deep interests in their own thing, yeah. which is pretty cool. It's kind of um, scary in the sense that my kid is becoming a, a different person in their own time in their own world in their own way uh, but it's also exciting because you get to do more of you yeah um is that tough to find the balance as far as there are days um i wake up very early you know i'm the first one up how early is early like five o'clock okay five thirty. that's a good time to get up it is yeah. and you know i have the house to myself but it's just a matter of ensuring that all of the housework is done and then getting the kids up and then getting them ready for school and sending them on their way and by that time it's about 7 30 yeah and then i have this like five hour block to myself where i can um either work on something you know actor related i call it you know work on my business sure sure you know going to the gym very important Mm -hmm. you know um if there are days where i have to drive somewhere be somewhere do something participate in activity like i'm doing right now yes and (laughs) um and then at two o'clock they're out of school and then then my focus shifts back onto them until about 9 9 30 until when they go to bed yeah So it's not, you know, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, in quotes, you know. I don't have a nine-to-five. Yeah. So my husband is the one who essentially provides, but because I'm not bringing in substantial income, we're kind of working with a limited set of, you know, givens. Sure. Um, But he knew that when he met me, that I was an artist first. Right. And... He also, we make the agreement before you get married and tie the knot. How do you want to, how do we want to play this out? How do we want to live our lives? What's yeah. important to us? So it's not a problem come down the road. So he's very supportive. Yeah. He knows it's who I am. He's consistent. You know? He's, you know, and he yeah. has, he does, he does great. You know, he, um, my husband's name, my husband's name is Drew. Hi, Drew. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Yeah. And he, uh, his interest you know outside of work he's fascinated by the ancient world you know primarily ancient rome yeah greece and he makes trips out to rome and kind of follows in these footsteps of the ancient romans and goes to these locations and has been to many cities and you know, all of all of like, you know, he's checked off the top 10 where everybody tends to go to when they go to Rome, you want to see the Colosseum, mm-hmm. etc. But now he's kind of looking into these alternative places sure. that not a lot of people go to and um, off the beaten path, so to speak. Yeah. And so we, you know, he's going to be gone soon for a week or so. And so I allot that time for him to just go and do his thing. Sure. And, do you ever go to Rome with Not him? yet. We What we've decided, we want to wait until the kids are old enough where yeah. we can go as a family. Sure, sure. So my firsts will be their firsts as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I can dig it. <laughs> so. That's awesome. I have to see if he's willing to get on a podcast because that seems pretty valuable. He's Well, you know, I've actually tried to convince my husband to be on some kind of podcast to talk about... Um, what he does for a living working in sales and consulting and comparing it to a lot of the challenges that actors face sure. as far as trying to manage their own business yes. and to find work for themselves. And a lot of it is the same. Yeah. You know, he lives in a world where people are consistently celebrating their victories and you don't tend to see how much work work goes into obtaining that and the same thing is true with actors yeah you know no one really talks about 
how much you put in in order to obtain your 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 goals or to win that role and the vernacular is different yeah and it's fascinating hearing it come from somebody who works in the business that he works in. He works in tech. And comparing it to somebody who works in film or in acting, the vernacular is different, but the activity and the feelings as a result of that, it's all the same. Right. So I thought it would be a really fascinating kind of like podcast to, you know, maybe three people at the table talking about it or four people. And comparing apples. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I, yeah, and I know I've worked in sales briefly, and it was commission only, so there's an even harder motivation <laughs> there. Um, but you're right, the, the process of believing in your product, whether it's yourself or some sort of material product that you're trying to sell, that's the game. And being convincing through your own confidence and trying to keep your integrity intact <laughs> when you're trying to sell something you're not 100% sure you know about, all about. Like those are very hard challenges, and I think it's the same thing with, uh, with acting, where uh, you know you, you want people to experience the real you, but you also want to make, you know, make some things happen. So, yeah, tough, tough world to navigate. It's tough. He's um, he's a great conversationalist, you know, and a communicator, and um, he is himself. I think initially when I when I first met him, that was a quality that I was drawn to and that he was so comfortable in his own skin. Yeah. And as actors, if we can only accept that, uh, accept ourselves yeah. and be comfortable in our own skin, especially when we walk into the audition room. Yes. Then that's when the magic happens. Right. That's when things start coming your way. Yeah. When we're trying too hard yeah. to be more than or be like something else, or trying too hard to sort of reach some expectation of what we think we're, or how we're supposed to be, that's when we're isolated and not enough is going on. Yeah, and it's, it just makes it impossible for people to connect if, yeah. uh, if you're not present. And I think that's really what happens is you, your mind is messing with you, and you may not be in the room even though you're in the room, and that's, that's pretty tough to to land the part if you're you're not exactly in it, you know? Yeah, it is all about commitment. I think you having a background as you do in in the industry Mm -hmm. certainly gives you a natural ability to kind of ride the wave easier than maybe somebody who's just getting into it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it all boils down, like anything, it all boils down to how how much you like it, how much you love it. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you find yourself obsessing over it when you're at home taking care of kids or yeah. vacuuming the floor you're always thinking about it it's true um but it's such a healthy thing to have because there are many other things that could take your time that might be a little more damaging yeah you know? <laughs> yeah it's true and i um i consider myself really lucky i mean getting to this point and even though i'm just at a level in my career where i am ready to start, uh, how can I best put it, ready to start like penetrating that next tier mm-hmm. because it is a tier system. Sure. Um, what does that look like, though? What does that mean? Well, what it means when, and I am a big fan of Bonnie Gillespie, and I don't know if, you know, if you're familiar with her, But uh, she wrote a book called Self-Management for Actors, and she really breaks it down. She's casting director, and she has almost 30 years of experience under her belt. She's also an actor herself, and she lends her knowledge to the acting world because she's, she's just one of those people who feels it's very important to help people to achieve their dreams. Yeah. And, but she's very real, you know, and I, I love her candor because she tells it the way it is. But as far as a tier system goes, when you're thinking about quote unquote big time, you know, let's say if you want to be on episodic television, you know, a lot of people do. There are people who'd rather just be in movies. I mean, there's so many ways you can kind of like decide where, what path you want to take. But when it's episodic television, it is kind of like a step-by-step process where before you even consider going into, like going into L.A., 
you be better off having some kind of a background in doing lots of independent film, lots of theater, to fine tune what you are and who you are. Yeah. And some people say, well, I play this character really, really well. But it's almost like it's not even about that. Yeah. It's just that your natural essence and the roles that you're playing that have more to do with who you just are as you yes. rather than being some kind of characterish type. Sure. I can do done tons of dialects and I can play yeah. all these different characters. Like, that's great. But... And it's great for theater, and it's great for maybe creating your own content. Sure. But if you're ready to go into the big leagues, it's all watered down, and it's, okay, I want to somehow get onto a show, and how do I go about doing that? You know, you have your agent, and maybe an agent who is casting shows that you feel like you're a good fit for, mm -hmm. so you can at least get into an audition room to maybe land a co-star role, which is just a five and under. And that's it. You know, and it could be you look like somebody who looks like a victim, you know, and yeah. it could be something as simple as, officer, I, I saw him run that way. Yeah. You know, but you look like a person who would be some kind of neurotic individual. Sure. And maybe you can play that really well. Yeah. And that's how they try to fill those slots. Sure. So once you get into, I hate this word, branding, brand, <laughs> once yeah. you're uh, branded as being a certain type, <laughs> sure, that's how you get your foot in the door. Yeah, yeah. And then you get known for doing that. And then there's a level of trustworthiness based on the fact that you have professional experience. And then it goes from there so that's the first tier second tier could be guest guest star maybe some kind of reoccurring role a lot of actors i think earn a living by having these roles yeah. and it's not like they're consistently getting cast in them yeah it's once in a blue moon sure and then all of the work that they do in between um in order to keep themselves aligned with those opportunities yeah and you know I've talked to professionals who are kind of living the dream, so to speak, in L.A. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody's working really hard. Everybody, it's, you know, is almost near broke. You know, it's sure. kind of like paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Most people, you know, not, not the, the upper crust that we all strive and dream we could be. But I think even with that, you have some A-list actors who are managing their careers and there are a lot of people that work for them that they're responsible for. Yeah. And so, you know, people are catering to their needs, sure. but they're also paying these people for their time. Well, so. I think when you're when you're new uh, or you're trying to establish yourself in the industry, the hunger that comes from your paycheck to paycheck lifestyle it keeps you motivated, yeah. keeps you grounded, uh, keeps things real with you. You don't get carried away with the glitz and glamour and the, the laziness that comes with, you know, a luxurious lifestyle. Um, and I think that when you do establish yourself and you've got some momentum and you're doing well and then you're responsible for others, I think that replaces it. And I think a lot of A-listers get into philanthropy because it grounds them. The, right. the connection to human pain and suffering and, and helping one another keeps things real because, you know, like I said, it gets a little nebulous at the top, I would imagine, yeah. when you don't really know who's after what in every relationship you know, especially new ones. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, a lot of interesting challenge. You said your next goal is to get to the second tier, which you were saying is... Well, first uh, tier, yeah. you know, I would love to land a, just a co-star. Are you willing to go to LA kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, I'm, I'm willing. I mean, I, it's come to that. I feel like I've exhausted my resources um, in Sacramento. Sure. If anything, it's just in Sacramento... There is both SAG and non-union work. I'm SAG eligible. And so I'm kind of riding in between. You know, I'm not a must join yet, but uh, there's limits. You know, you're either doing local commercials. You could be some, if there's a, a big movie that comes to town, whether it's in Sacramento or even in the Bay Area, to be on 
uh, blockbuster set, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, there's tons of background work. Sure. You know? everybody, everybody I know has at least been on the set of something that had huge names attached to sure, it. Sure, sure. Uh, so there's a lot of that. And then there's a lot of independent film, ultra low budget, SAG, ultra low budget, you know. Would you say that <clears throat> most of the work in this area is to get your feet wet? I think so. I think it's a wonderful launching pad. But yeah. at the same time, I'm very careful in saying that. Because that's essentially what it is now, but I know that the Sacramento region has, um, it's, it's, it's simmering, and it's about to boil over. That's how I feel. Yeah. You know, there's a, a, a lot happening locally. There's a, now a film commissioner position that's currently being filled at the state house interesting who and this person is really going to take it upon themselves to see what the metrics are in surrounding areas to understand okay how are we going to bring more film to sacramento and in doing so what resources do we have in order to fulfill the need for sure. whoever it is that comes to town. For any production, yeah. And so that is currently being put into place. That's uh, exciting. It is exciting. Yeah, that's really <laughs> so, exciting. So, it, it, I mean, when you look at it, I know that Sacramento and surrounding areas is beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's so much here. Yes. Just the natural lay of the land. We've already got a taste of it with Lady Bird and uh, Big Love filmed a, a shot down town at the uh, delta king nice <laughs> yeah years ago but yeah we've had little bits and pieces of it sacramento keeps popping up in mainstream and media Dion taylor and yeah traffic right and uh that was actually shot not too far from where i live mm -hmm. some scenes where it's beautiful and cool and auburn and i could see like oh okay they actually i recognize that area i know yeah. exactly where that is yeah 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 you know? but um so, so yeah, it, it seems limited now. It's just a matter of time before it explodes. Yeah. And everyone is feeling it. Bay Area is very commercially driven. A lot of commercials right. are shot in and around that area. Right. Um, so there's only so much you can do with that. Yeah. I actually um, haven't done very many commercials. I seem to, honestly, I seem to strike out when it comes to that. I just don't seem to fill what they're looking for. Sure. But I do a lot of independent film yeah. and a lot of short films. And and I love it. I'm always busy doing something. Sure. So, yeah, I'd love to take the next step agent in LA and see what opportunities are there for something yeah and then just grind it out and whatever that'll take do you think that it's legitimate to to say that for each demographic presents different challenges in LA uh in terms of getting work such as you know being a white blonde woman mm -hmm. versus a burnett um you know, do you think those present more opportunities in some way or less opportunities? I think that it's things have definitely changed. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, me, I'm a, a white blonde woman. Mm -hmm. I, I know who I am. I know how I come across when somebody first meets me. They don't know where I'm from and what my background is, but they make assumptions based on how I look and they're usually wrong. And what is that typical <laughs> first assumption of you? I want to know what, what you think or what you know it is. And then I'll tell you what my first impression was. Well, I, I, I talked to this person once and, you know, she looked at me and we were talking about where we came from and she just like rambled off on an assumption that I came from a quote unquote deeply homogenized area. And I was thinking to myself, what does what she mean by that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I was like, well, actually, you're wrong. And it, and it was like, okay, what do you mean by that? And then the conversation begins, you know? So I'm from a really rough and tumble city, the city of New Bedford. You can Google search it. Better, better yet, look it up in Urban Dictionary. <laughs> New Bedford? New Bedford, Massachusetts. Okay. It's about 40 minutes south of Boston. Okay. It's on the water. It's known for its fishing industry. Okay. okay. It used to be the whaling capital of the world. 
And this is a city where you, you have some nice parts of town, but not really. Everybody that I know growing up was struggling financially. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there was a, a moment in time where, I mean, living in poverty even, you know, those were my friends. Right. You know, you live in an area where no one has anything. You know, you go to a high school where people are all working afternoon jobs to try and make it happen for themselves. Sure. And they have this strong work ethic. And as far as demographics go, it's predominantly Portuguese, Cape Verdean, Puerto Rican, Black, and French Canadian. That's where I come in. That's my background. Ah. My dad is French Canadian, and my mom is Irish and Czech. And um, when you think of like the history of of Boston Irish and how you know people coming over from Ireland after the yeah. potato famine, or even during that time, that's my mother's ancestry. My father's ancestry goes much further back um, in Acadia and what was considered to be New France in Quebec. And the French who had come over in the 1600s and had, um, they, they, you know, they weren't a group of people that came in and started pillaging the indigenous peoples, the Mi'kmaq, as it were. They assimilated. So that's my father's ancestry. So, you know, when you're with your kind, if you want to call it that, sure. especially if it's in a, a working class city like the city of New Bedford. I mean, you've got gang violence, you've got tons of crime, you know, sure. it's known for some pretty awful things. And growing up, it was, you know, where are you from to other people who live in Massachusetts? It's like, well, I'm from New Bedford. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, anybody who's from New Beige who's listening to this right now, I mean, we love our shitty city. Yeah. I mean, I, I love yeah. the city of New Bedford. I have a lot of pride because I know what the struggle's all about, Yeah, you know? And so when you're in school, you know, you're in high school, you're in middle school, all that stuff, it's not about what you're wearing on your feet and the cap that you have on your head, you know, it's not about the bike that you're riding or even the car that you drive because it was more or less about how good are you at something. Yeah. And you always aspired to be like the older kids because they had more freedom. Sure. Because like when you're growing with that up with that kind of struggle, you're trying to figure out, you know, how can I get something? How can I get ahead? And... It blows my mind when, actually, back to this job that I had when I was working in corporate America, I had a boss who made a comment to me about you coming from your your Boston high horse type of thing. I was like, what are you talking about? And this guy's from Inglewood, <laughs> yeah. and he, he's since passed away, unfortunately. His name is Eric Jones, rest in peace. He was a super cool guy. But I, um, I was like, what are you talking about? And so we, we talked a little bit. And he was like, okay, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. The other thing that I had to overcome by living in that area is having a really thick southeastern Massachusetts accent. Mm-hmm. And I had to work to lose that dialect because it was so working class that I was told when I was studying classical voice that you got to lose your accent or else you're not going to get a decent paying job. That's crazy. Yeah. And so there are all these things that kind of align themselves where being an actor now and seeing the struggles that people have you know and I think the struggles for people of color it's the awareness of the situations that are happening the awareness of the awareness if you will yeah you know there's a lot of that going on and the time has come and so for somebody like me it's really important for me to speak up and be supportive, yeah. you know, and, and I align myself with that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you, you think of, of groups of people where you have your allegiance, my allegiance are to people who are struggling, Yeah, you know, as far as, uh, acting where you look at jobs and the difficulties that people have getting jobs, mm-hmm. the, Pendulum is swung in the direction of favoring people of color 
and diversity in that sense, you know? People who are ethnically ambiguous, people who are black, people mm -hmm. who are Puerto Rican, people who are Asian, you know, people who have these backgrounds where it's like, okay, we truly are a melting pot. For blonde women, I mean, holy shit, I have the same hair color as Donald Trump. <laughs> Sure. You know, like for, for people like me, it's like, no, no, no. You're kind of like last on the list in a sense, unless it's something very specific to how you look. Yeah. And, and I see it and I'm aware of it and I don't have a problem with it. I don't because I like and in, in love with just how much people are coming together and what they're doing, you know, and... I grew up with diversity. I don't know how to live any other way. If I'm, if I'm where I live right now, it's, it is deeply homogenized. And guess what? It makes me feel uncomfortable. Hmm. And I'm going on the record to say that. If any of my family members are listening to this, they'd be like, oh, yeah, they understand, you know? Yeah. So, um, but that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's my background, you know, where I'm from. And when people meet me, they think one thing and assume a, a set of givens in a sense. But once they get to know me, they're just like, there's like a stark contrast. Yeah. <laughs> with how you look on the outside with who you are, yeah. you know. And it's, it's very validating, though, to, to hear your, your experience because I think that uh, this whole polarizing thing that's happening is is just a like a, a trend of thinking just how to think about things and when you hear somebody's you have a conversation with somebody and you hear how colorful their background really is and it doesn't match what you thought in the first place kind of thing it makes you feel like you belong to the same thing it's it's uh liberating <laughs> you know because i we all do it right we you know we're we're vulnerable to the crap we're sold on tv and yeah. and the media like we watch it we hear it and even though we don't agree with a lot of it it's still in there and so you know when your environment matches what you've been told represents a certain thing you have these preconceived ideas that you got to shuffle through right. you know what i mean it's like all this crappy paperwork on your desk before you get to the root of what you're trying to solve you know and uh, at the end of the day it's all what you think about Right, because because we're all we all have our own set of struggles. I imagine you walk into a lot of spaces where you're summed up quite quite rapidly, mm -hmm. and you, to some degree, probably enjoy that because you get to kind of poke around and see who's who and who's real or realistic, <laughs> and who's caught up in the details. You know what I mean? It separates uh, some of the intellect, um, but uh, otherwise, I I. Th when I first met you, I'm like, look at this wholesome white lady. I'm afraid to say a cuss word. <laughs> oh, my God. And then, you know what set me free or set us free? <laughs> the accents. Oh, yeah, yeah. On that set? Yeah. yeah. Playing around with the accents, <laughs> being silly. It was like, all bets are off. We can be whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> You know what I mean? And like, that's what I love about <laughs> accents. I think for the longest time, like you were saying, you know, I can do different dialects, I can be different characters. And I thought that's what my ability to do accents was supposed to take me to, was to do something in acting with. But honestly, I think it's just a communication tool. It's to break down walls and, and open the conversation up. And I yeah. think, you know, it's a great party favor. People just, they let their guard down and they're like, oh yeah, let's play, you know? And oh yeah. Yeah. So that's great. I think, you know, that's fun for, for, I would assume fun for you in some, some measures, you know? It is. I, I, um, I have a much better time of it when I feel like, um, I'm with, people who would be more apt to understand me yeah. you know and where i'm from yeah. than people who haven't experienced a struggle you know and so it's a very interesting thing that happened and this is kind of heavy but i'm just going to talk about it and you know um a couple of weeks ago my kid's school was on a lockdown because some jokester and it's a middle school some jokester decided to write a note 
and leave it in the bathroom, that they wanted to shoot up the school and inflict harm on faculty as well. And what ended up happening was it backfired, whoever this child was, um, it backfired on them. They just wanted to get out of school early. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was taken very seriously, zero tolerance, school on lockdown. You know, parents are receiving texts and phone calls and the whole nine yards. And next thing you know, the sheriff's department is there. The police is there. Several kids were arrested and cuffed and put in the back of vehicles. And and that's what happens when you mess around like that. Mm -hmm. I was really upset when that happened. Um for multitude of reasons, and I'm not even going to state the obvious. But my sister and I are having a conversation about it. I, you know, I was talking to her about it, and her response to that was, you know, that pisses me off where you live, where the kids are so spoiled, because in areas where people experience struggle, like where she and I, where we grew up, yeah, you don't mess around like that. Right. You, you don't, but, but they think it's funny, you know, because they have so much going for them. They all mm. come from really great homes, et cetera, et cetera. They kind of think it's funny to just get away with that and do it. If they were from a family of hardworking people who are struggling, mm. just the, the, the nature of being raised like that from a good home, even though there's no money there, so to speak, but being raised in a home where people have their values in order would not, I don't think that, that you, that doesn't happen. Like you don't have schools going on lockdown in some of the poorer neighborhoods. Not necessarily for something like that. No, not for, not for something like that yeah. where it's like a jokester, right. you know? Yeah. But it seems like in areas of affluence, it's there it there seems to be you know it lends itself to an area like that yeah sure i think if it's going on in in the poorer neighborhoods it's usually something that's more legit like somebody something's going down yeah yeah you know right right but it's uh and so things have to be kind of like sectioned off and all of that but um how were your kids after that experience well they were not so much confused by what was happening. They were scared when they were put into sh- place. They couldn't leave. They were How in a scary. gymnasium. They didn't know what was going on. Um, to me, it's sad because it's just become a part of like our everyday lives. It's just a, another component of our brain. It's there. We have to think about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to think about this stuff as a kid, you know, uh, but yeah, they have their lockdown drills. They this is the second time that they've been on some kind of lockdown in their school, um, and it's unfortunate, you know. But yeah, just kind of back to what we were talking about originally, you know, where you're looking at areas and situations and just kind of how people are based upon where they're from, you know. Yeah. And and you've mentioned this a couple times that uh essentially that a lot of what we project out there um in society with each other does come from what's what we're, you know, what we're observing online and it's really just a mind game in a lot of ways. Um what how much exposure do your kids get to to social media or just just YouTube or any of that stuff? Um, We monitor it, so not a lot. Yeah. You know, my daughter loves YouTube and that she follows all of these little, you know, she's subscribed to all of these (laughs) channels. Yeah, yeah. Where if it's not about doggos and good boy, you know, (laughs) doggies and... She um, she loves to draw, so she follows a lot of animators. Okay. And she likes to look at satisfying videos, and she yeah, yeah. you know she finds these little short videos, and so hers is monitored, and you can um, go in and actually set it to where they're not being exposed to you know so much of the negative content that's out there. Yeah. And my son as well. He has a cell phone. Um, 
he's very drawn to things like conspiracy theories and that he he understands that there's a reality and there's a false reality and so he's fascinated by that um he likes crime shows you know That's cool, mini documentaries yeah. things like that deep thinker but i'll say look anytime it's like luke give me your phone yeah. you know and yeah. i'll start scrolling through sure um, and that's it. They don't sit in front of a computer and have like full on access. Neither one of them have social media accounts good. other than YouTube in I that they good. subscribe. Sure. Yeah. My son did have a, um, Instagram account, but we stopped that because there aren't, you can't put a limit on that account. Yeah. I mean, you can search information and he loves memes and so you know, and dank memes and sure, <laughs> it kind sure, of like sure. the ball just keeps rolling with the memes. Yeah. Uh, so he was looking at that on Instagram, but it was the other kids or other people that he was coming into contact with. And we said, nope. Yeah. That yeah. came to an abrupt end. And then we even limit the time that they're on there. So Monday through Thursday, no internet, no electronic devices, nothing. <laughs> Until Friday afternoon, sure. Then you know my son will play video games, and my daughter will be doing her thing, and she plays video games too, like Minecraft and yeah. Roblox and things like that. But yeah, it's pretty limited, and you know I feel I feel bad when I'm like, no, absolutely not. Go outside, find something to do. Yeah. you know. And then I'm like, no, I'm, I pat myself on the back because then I'll look out of the corner of my eye and they're occupying themselves with something other yeah. than technology. Yeah, yeah. It's awful. The yeah. Way it's just like overrun everything. Yeah. How? <clears throat> so how do you feel like that they're pretty compliant in, in maintaining some level-headed outlook on what they, they are, look for? Yeah. They are. They... Um, you know, on occasion, and, you know, any parents listening to this who have kids who are tweens or teens, you know, there have been those occasions where my son has been exposed to something, usually from some other kid showing it. Yeah, yeah. And you can't control that. Right. That he was, he was floored by it. Mm-hmm. And some of the awful evils of the world yeah. that are on the internet that you can watch yeah. these things happen. Yeah. And so he was really upset. He came to me. We talked about it. And I said to him, I'm so sorry that you were exposed to that, that you saw that stuff. Yeah. And I said, it's never going to leave your mind. It's always going to be there. Yeah. And you have to tell yourself, do I want this, this, this stuff in my head, in my mind, mm-hmm. day to day? Yeah. Do I want my thoughts to gravitate to that? Do I want to be thinking about those things? He's like, no. And I said, okay. Well, you know that if somebody's trying to show you something or if you see a tempting link, you know, to some graphic imagery, don't look at it. Really don't. Don't look Seriously, at it. Seriously. Yeah. It is. And it's, it's, and for his age, being the age, being age 12. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's some kids who are kind of cruel. Hey, look at this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not funny. It's pretty absurd the accessibility that they have now. And a lot like <clears throat> like drugs, you know, kids kids are prone to do things you don't want them to do, you know, quite often, depending on your relationship with them. And so it's it's tough to find a balance, I think, uh, for a lot of parents on how to help their children understand. Because the truth is, if they want to see something, they'll find a way. Whether they can have it during the week or the weekend, or they get somebody at school who has a phone and all access. And I think that's the the rule of thumb is that you can't completely control what what they look for, but you can educate them on what that information can do to them. And I think that's the right approach is to, to explain to them, do you want this in your mind? You know, uh, and if you don't, you really need to be selective about what you allow into your life. And that's the, you know, that's a pretty good approach as far as I'm concerned, because I don't think there's a way to completely stop them from seeing a lot of things. And I think that it's scary watching bullying, the evolution of bullying 
in today's world and how, you know, when we were kids, bullying's fairly normal when it comes to growing up around other, you know, young kids trying to figure out who they are as young adults. Uh, the sad part is that it doesn't turn off, you know, whereas when we were kids, you go home, you know, weeks go, week goes by, whatever. But nowadays, you know, you go home, especially in high school, the suicide rate going up with these kids is so devastating. And to know that when they go home, it doesn't stop. It's online and it's just floating around. Right, and when they right. come back to school, new ideas have come about and they just get tormented daily. And teaching our kids resilience is the most important thing we can do now because that stuff ain't going anywhere. It's not. And it 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 infuriates me that it's it's come to that you know um you know i definitely i've definitely been bullied as a kid you mm-hmm. know grammar school sure junior high especially with that accent high school. i mean we all well we all had <laughs> you all accents. did yeah you know coming from new bedford massachusetts we all had accents and we're all sitting around you know talking to one another look at that over there you know Um, growing up in New Bedford, kids made fun of one another. Nobody really cared all that much what they said and just, just just the way it was. But, uh, oh gosh, like I had a paper route when I was 12 and going up and down the streets, like delivering these newspapers. And it was like, I couldn't just get through the damn neighborhood (laughs) and do my job without some neighborhood kids like saying stuff to me and tormenting me in some way. And some of the stuff that they said, you know, looking back on it, I remember thinking what they said was actually really funny. Yeah. And and then (laughs) that's a good one. But, you know, at the time I couldn't laugh because I was like kind of sad too. And, but, you know, I did. I just kind of let it roll off my back. You know, and then my siblings, too, they all experienced some form of bullying. I'll never forget this one time where my brother was like, he was a freshman in high school. You know, he's a a year behind me, two years behind my older sister. And we're sitting at the front of the bus because you don't want to sit the back of the bus, heaven forbid. And he somehow got dragged to the back of the bus. (laughs) And a bunch of kids just jumped on him. Oh, wow. And all I remember is being really scared, but thinking to myself, he can hold his own. And I was so afraid to look back to see what was going on. And then I see a sock of his getting thrown at the back of the head of the bus driver. (laughs) (laughs) So then I turn around, I look to the back of the bus, and I just see these two legs kind of like sticking up, like he was upside down in the back of the bus. They turned him upside down. They took his shoes off. They took his socks off and they were just like, and so he got up, he got up and the bus driver said, sit down, sit down. He's like, I'm just getting my socks. You know, (laughs) (laughs) he sits down and he's sitting with us. We get off our stop, and then he jumps out of the bus, and he's all like, "Come get me, you guys!" He's like he's saying all this stuff, yeah. and they were older kids. Sure. And then fast forward, you know, they're friends. Yeah. Like they all know sure. each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it was that kind of sort of like home, screwing around. Yeah, like homegrown kind of bullying. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of kids who are in gangs and stuff in mm-hmm. high school, and so that was. When, you, when I got into high school, it was like a whole level of just kind of fear and stuff that you would go out of your way to avoid yeah. because things would happen on school premises and everyone just kind of clears out yeah. because you don't want to be in the line of fire. I mean, not that kids had guns because we had metal detectors, sure. but it was more or less, um, you just don't want to get hit by accident. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it has, it's, it, I mean, that's not bullying. That's just like, again, life that, in high school, life in high school, yeah. kids struggling, you know, testosterone and they just, they have it out for one another. Young men. You know? Yeah. Mostly that. Yeah. They just, and it can happen at any time, you know, a fight will start. And what do you do? You know, tough times, yeah. tough time. And I think about that often that, that, You know, we're separated from what that life is like for high schoolers. And it's uh, it's different now than it was with 
with social media technology as it is phones, uh, you know, readily available in class. Um, I think that presents a completely different experience uh, in high school. And I, I often think about these kids and like how tough that must be to navigate. Cause back when, before all that stuff, it was tough to navigate. So yeah, tough time. But I just, I'm interested in, in how, you know, your mothering skills and what you do to, to prepare your kids for it. Cause I was telling my son last night, I'm like, dude, future's going to be really different. I said, you'll be lucky if you even have to drive a car. Mm -hmm. honestly like you probably just gonna be able to take a nap between work and home you know by the time you get to be my age and I said but that'll be cool you know and I think a lot of what happens now is kids are taught not to look to the future and to think that the future is is bleak and that it's uh gonna be mostly negative and we keep fueling this idea that things are going bad I don't personally think so and I think it's our job and our obligation to teach our kids positive outlooks, mm-hmm. even if shit goes down. Because <laughs> nobody wants to be in the room with that guy who's freaking out, saying, we're all going to die. No. Nobody wants to be next to that person, you know? And I think um, something as fundamental as leadership, as a, as a personality trait, is what we need to kind of focus on with these kids. Because you can't stop them from seeing what they're going to see. Right. But you can teach them what that information will do to them and to their the health of their mind and um and what their their example of existence means to other people. You know, and, and I think um I'm excited to meet people or parents who strive to, to get positive, you know, uh, embedded in their kids' minds mm-hmm. because um us adults that are from, you know, the 80s and 70s, we're, we have our own struggles. I think that's underappreciated, too. Yeah. You know, we, we, were, we have ADD, ADHD, just like the kids <laughs> do, but they're the ones who get all the, the you know, the hoopla about it. Um, but it's interesting. And you were saying that you, were, you started out Catholic, mm-hmm. but now you're kind of reformed. Mm-hmm. What, what does that mean to you exactly? Um. I didn't have any negative experiences personally growing up and being raised Catholic. Uh, You know, for my mom and for my dad, they're both Catholic. A lot of people growing up on the East Coast, I mean, literally on the coast, and we're not talking, we're talking north of the Mason-Dixon, what was the Mason-Dixon line. Mm -hmm. Um, You have a lot of Catholic. Catholics, and it's culturally embedded into their lives. If you're Irish Catholic, if you're Italian and you're Catholic, if you're French Canadian, if you're Catholic, you know, um, and then you have a lot of Chinese that are Catholic and in California too, you know, if you're Hispanic and you're Catholic, I mean, Catholicism kind of reigns supreme. So I, all of my friends are Catholic growing up. I had some friends who have a Jewish background too, um, but that wasn't until I got into college and they were from pretty much the Boston area Mm -hmm. because there is a a Jewish population. And then there's also a Christian Orthodox population when you have groups of people like Armenians and stuff that Mm -hmm. are living outside of Boston. Um, and then Cambodians too, just like you have a lot of Cambodians who kind of gravitated to Stockton, you have a Cambodian community in, I think it's Lynn, Massachusetts, North Shore, Boston, Okay. you know, and they maintain their culture and they keep it alive. And so, um, yeah, being raised Catholic, I never had any negative experiences. I was exposed to just kind of being patient and experiencing the world through the eyes of people mostly who were people that I loved very much. Mm -hmm. And there was always this scholarly sort of way of accepting Christ into your life and God into your life. And you were valuing education and not limiting it. And I felt like growing Catholic, I was encouraged to be open-minded and to explore, not so much limiting what I knew, because I feel that there are Christians who choose to accept the world as being a certain way, and 
that's it. Then here, here am I being taught, you know, there's a vastness to the universe. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a vastness to space, you know, there's a vastness to the human condition and all that goes along with it, you know, and what we're prone to and our free will, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I, I was lucky I had that exposure um, it fueled a lot of the things that I'm passionate about in terms of music and art and just appreciation worldwide. Um, it's not until my late twenties that all of these stories started to surface where it was really gaining momentum, you know, and the archdiocese of Boston had a really big problem on their hands. Mm -hmm. And continue to do so. And there's this betrayal that comes along with it because you trusted it so much, you know, as an sure. entity. You trusted it so much. But to know that there's activity going on that I was unaware of, and then you're deeply saddened and shocked in this place that you called home spiritually is not a place you can trust right just being as as a church sure so you distance yourself from it does not mean that um you know i i won't say any negative things mm -hmm. because i know that there are people everybody's aware of it you know i'm throwing shade on the Catholic Church, because of the things that have transpired, and the not only betrayal, but there's also a tremendous amount of denial that came along with that. Right. You know, right. with what priests were being accused of. Made me very sad. I was infuriated. And then it's just like a relationship that you felt compelled to just right. sever. And yeah. that's what I ended up doing. But I still think and feel like a person who's been raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. I, when I talk to other people who've been raised Catholic, immediately you drop into this sort of like, oh, okay, you know how this other person's been raised, yeah. you know, the culturally just kind of how they perceive things. And then you feel like you're to a certain degree with a like mind. Um, so that's what's happened as far as what I've had to do in order to place it somewhere sure. else in my life. Yeah. As I, as it stands now, I, all of my friends know how much, you know, I have a very strong faith in God mm -hmm. and I'm not afraid to express that. Sure. Um, I will, I'm always in some kind of state of prayer, praying for my friends. My friends know that I, it's something that I do, and I take it very seriously in meditation, um, you know, and also reading some scripture that kind of enables, a, you know, something to think about. But I would never feel compelled to shame somebody if mm -hmm. they're not on board. Yeah. You know, it'll come when it, when it, when it happens. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I... Um, that's kind of how it all came to pass in a sense, you know. Sure. Yeah. Um, I find that a lot of Catholics come from either their own bad experience in Catholicism or, are you know, know the stories all too well about some of the things that, that the traditional Catholic Church kind of brought about. Um but I think that obviously we learned a lot from it. Um, but I'm trying not to be too repetitive because I've talked about this a lot. Um, but at the core, I think that people are evolving and that some of the people that tainted some of those ideas before um, just come from a different time, a different reality, and had a different impression of what all of that meant, all of the biblical stories and the translations of those things. But I think I think that most people are up for some reform, <laughs> you know? And I, I was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jordan Peterson, uh, but he's a clinical psychologist who took some interest um, 
in the Bible and the history of it and the the length of time that it's been around and what the stories mean and the patterns in the Bible and kind of just looking at all the different angles of what the Bible is. Um, have you ever seen the movie Book of Eli with Denzel I haven't Washington? Seen that, no. It's it's a it's a rendition of the future after a, some sort of war or solar flare or mm-hmm. some some crazy post apocalyptic scenario where the only book uh, that that matters is the Bible and they they the humanity did its best to try and get rid of most of the Bibles but there's only one left that Denzel has and he's kind of on this Christ like journey. Uh, through the other end of the world, you know, he's going west, as he put it. And along the way, he faces all these, um, you know, these hurdles that he's got to overcome. Uh, but at the, the, the moral of the story is that the, the stories of the Bible uh, give us, as humanity, uh, some faith, a place to put that faith so that we don't just kill each other. And at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, um, Gary Oldman's the the heel in the story. He's amazing. <laughs> but at the end of the movie, he he wasn't able to accomplish what he wanted, and he's just kind of, you know, at his wit's end, and he's basically about to die. He's got, you know, a gunshot wound, and he's leaned up against this, this banister up on a balcony, and down below is like a bar scene where people are being being raped and beaten and... It's people <laughs> without faith, essentially. And I, I like that. I like the idea that it's not the Bible that is the problem. It's the people who create the religion, you know, yeah. for the Bible or for the sake of the Bible. And we just, we, we need to just come to terms like we have some really bad old ideas. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that's a bad thing, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I'm... I'm getting at is that I think uh, we we could find a version of world peace for ourselves if we just kind of tweak the perspective a little bit. You don't have to give up everything. Right. You don't have to like everything. I understand some things you're not attracted to and, and not necessarily sexually, just intellectually. You're not attracted to those ideas. That's great. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a community out there for you. Go go find your friends. Go belong. You know, find a, a nucleus that makes you happy and thrive and share ideas. But don't don't close the door mm-hmm. on anybody, you know, because it doesn't really matter in the end. We're all, it's all the same, yeah. you know, so. It, it's, it's just accepting one another. You know, our inner light, whatever that is, sure. you know, and accepting it in your fellow human. I, one of my best friends is actually a Muslim, yeah. you know, and she and I, um, we have a lot in common and just how almost like hypersensitive we are to people around us and uh, to our friends. And she and I have had many conversations on just how sad we feel when we look at the pain and suffering of what other people are going through. And I know for her, being raised Muslim, um, it's an absolute that you do not let your fellow human, you know, fall by the wayside, you know, and, and for Christians, it's the same thing. But I think that, uh, you know, just with the, there's a lot of similarities we found being raised that we were raised than differences yeah. and we thrive on that and, um, I'm very happy that I have her in my life, you know, and we keep each other in check. Um, and then my husband is actually an atheist. You know? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like hardcore, slightly no, agnostic. No. It's, and... it's not even what's fascinating about that. And some people, when they hear that word atheist, they mm-hmm. almost think like, oh, automatically, this is a person who has some sense of superiority and they're going to make somebody feel bad about the fact that they have a sense of like faith and the belief in God. It's not like that at all. Um, he was raised Catholic like I was, but never really never really plugged into having a a faith in God. It just somehow, and I know he's not alone, he just, it didn't occur to him. Maybe it did, but it wasn't something that he relied on. 
You know? Sure. And so, if anything, him being an atheist, he's extremely proactive to letting people believe whatever it is that they want to believe. You know, you believe in God or not believe in God. You believe in whatever it is that you want. And he supports it. He doesn't, he doesn't say negative things about it. However, when it comes to religion, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Because religion has instilled a tremendous amount. Talk about pain and suffering on human beings. Sure, sure. For the sake of religion. Um, so he does not align himself with any kind of religion at all whatsoever. Yeah. You know, historically speaking, you look at the atrocities, especially that of the Catholic church, for example, yeah. I'm aware of it. I don't need to be schooled on it. You know, yeah. like, and we, we have these conversations and then I said to him, do you just, is there anything where you feel like. You know, when you think of somebody being agnostic to some degree, is there anything there? And it's kind of left open-ended. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Carl Sagan, and I love his perspective on things. He is an atheist, but when you listen to him talk about the nature of things in the universe, Mm -hmm. there's always that margin of... We don't know. Right. There's a great mystery to that. And he doesn't label it with anything. Sure. Out of respect. Because even though religion might be some form of evil, and he in his book, A Demon Haunted World, he goes into great lengths and he talks about that. But there are people of faith who have a, a, a drive to want to bring good into the world and, and tr- how they treat their fellow humans. And people of faith who are trying to figure the world out, you know, people who are science-driven, who also have a faith, Yeah. you know? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've brought that up to him, to my husband, and, and he, he, he accepts it. He understands sure. it wholeheartedly. He's reasonable. He's very reasonable, yeah. and, um, and he just enjoys being in the company of people like me. Yeah. And I also think that it's one of the reasons why he, you know, thinking of somebody he wanted to marry and he just saw how I kind of wear it on my sleeve and I'm not ashamed of it and I'm not pushing it on anybody. It's just like really living by the example. Yeah. And to him, he just thought, okay, this is a person that I want to spend the rest of my life with because, I mean, she is, she loves God. But it's she really does, you know? <laughs> and then uses it for the right reasons. Yeah, you know, uh, without being too judgmental either way. Just if it makes you a better person in your own world, then why not? Right, it makes sense. I have the same same thing going with uh, with Adriana, my girlfriend. She's, you know, she's got a a bit of a different dogma when it comes to how she looks at her religion, and you know. Um, but I think, you know, we, we've bonded uh, spiritually over the years. And I think, honestly, the relationship with her has brought some really godlike qualities to my life. And so um, it's undeniable that there's something going on. <laughs> and I can't turn the other cheek anymore. And I had done that before. And it didn't seem to serve me well. And, and since that, that, uh, that epiphany of sorts, things have always just shown up. You know, good karma seems to stay here often, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's magic. Yeah, I'm gonna ask some questions. I know we've kind of got caught okay. up in heavy. No, 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 it's all good. Heavy religious talk, um, which is fine, but uh, I like I like your take on things. <laughs> cool. Very fair. <laughs> yeah, your kids are lucky. I'm lucky that my kids in the same world as your kids. That's a promising thing. Promising fact. Um, what do you think about the most? It's probably acting, isn't it? Um, it, it is my, my kids and their well being. you know? Sure. I think about that the most, um, and how they're making their way through the world, you know, on a personal note. Yeah. It's, of course, it's my acting career, my dreams and aspirations, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. You got to have those. Yeah. I find. Yeah. Um, do you ever find men threatening? It depends. You know, yeah. I, I, and this is a topic that comes up a lot. It, it really sure. does. I have, I have a lot of male friends, you know, 
And I think that just as men kind of operate in the world, they are going by a different level of expectations than what women have to deal with. However, we all know that the playing field is the same in the sense that the opportunities are what they are. Uh, There are women who are out there who are making way, like they're so headstrong in terms of defining what it means to be fair and being treated fairly, you know, even in Hollywood. It's sad that it, it's, it's been going on for it long, as long as it has been, but it's great that there are women who are taking those chances and putting themselves in the spotlight and speaking out because I feel like there is still kind of a stigma that's attached to women who open their mouths and say something. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they, not that I find men threatening. Yeah. It's almost like, I know that there are men who are out there who are still threatened by that. And so that's frustrating. And it's, you know, I hate to say it. It's just some of the older generations that still kind of see things as being a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. And are more apt to be highly critical of, of women. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not threatened by men at all, you know? Yeah. Um, I've never had a problem. Really? You've <laughs> like, generally had a good experience? I have. I, it's like, you just kind of, I'm more of an observer sure. when I'm in, you know, situations I don't know people. And so I really kind of focus on the person and, and I know men who've had struggles in their lives just being men. Yeah. And and my heart goes out to them. Sure. You know, I can't, I can't be so critical of of uh, someone who maybe operates on so much instinctual behavior that it's just, I, I can't say I understand that. I I don't. Yeah. I'm not a man. Right. But um, it just it makes me sad when I'm in a situation being female and you kind of get elbowed out because you are female. Mm-hmm. And then you have to work that much harder to kind of prove your worth in a man-driven world, um, even in film still. Sure. You know, because most film sets, you mostly men kind of running things behind the scenes as far as what's happening production-wise while a film is being shot. I have just a handful of female friends who are legit filmmakers. Yeah. Everybody else is a man. And, um, but I don't feel threatened by that. As long as they're open-minded to the input of women on the fly and they're open-minded to a woman working in a technical aspect of what's going on and accepting the criticism coming from a woman, then that's great. You know, yeah, it's even, but is it, is it vastly different working on a, a set with a female director versus a male director? Um, not really. Not really. Uh, I mean, for me, just because of uh, on my being on the receiving end, working yeah. with a, a male director versus a, versus a female director, it's kind of like, to me, it's more or less how experienced are they working with actors and how can they convey information and convey what it is that they want and then being able to communicate that to actors and also being very effective in communicating their needs to either a DP or somebody who's running sound as they're watching and listening to things on the, on the fly. Yeah. Um, so it comes down to that, you know, um, that's cool. Yeah. 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 Well, good for you. I'm, I, uh, it's nice to hear that. Like I was telling you when you first got here, some of this stuff just, it's all I, my only experience of it is media and then to hear, you know, I had talked to mostly men starting this out and just recently, you know, I interviewed a female friend of mine. Um, but the stuff like the, the Me Too stuff and um, just the the world of women and men these days, you know, comparative yeah. to, to... It's a slippery slope because... For a woman to decide that, okay, I want to be outspoken about my experiences, 
but still, there's still a risk attached to that. Sure. You know, it's not, it's not over yet. Yeah. And when we look at ourselves as just beasts on the planet, you know, yeah. men are physically bigger and stronger and can take most women down. Sure. And when it, when you're looking at it from just that and that alone, then you feel it's, it can be scary. Yeah. So you have to mind yourself and what you're doing and when you're doing it. When I used to live in New York city, you know, spend a lot of time in New York, man, I, I always wore a jacket that had a hood on it. You had to. Yeah. Because you just, you never knew where you were going to be and who's going to be around you. So. I think that, uh, the, dis- the the disruption that this movement or this trend of thinking uh, has has caused some some growth for for men and I think ultimately men are gonna be freed up to finally feel comfortable just being themselves yeah and not trying to overcompensate because I think that's what it's done is that this this culture of masculinity and and you know kind of uh, owning the room with testosterone is a little outdated and it hasn't served a lot of people. There's probably a lot of lonely people who would otherwise not be lonely if they weren't overcompensating based on some old ideas, you know? So I think in the end, it's good. Mm -hmm. It seems a lot of things seem edgy and scary, but it's just change. It's change. It's change. Every generation thinks the next is screwed. I know. You know what I mean? I these know. kids, they don't even know. Oh, these kids, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. I told my son, I was like, dude, I didn't have, we didn't have phones when <laughs> I was a kid. You know, we had a, a thing in the wall that was attached to a cord that was attached to other cords in the <laughs> sky. It stretched and, beyond limits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, movies and stuff. We had to wait to get to school to talk about stuff like that. Like, it's a different world. But be excited, man. You know, you get to experience new things. You know, it's, it's going to be, it's gonna be a very colorful future, but I'm, I'm ultimately optimistic. I think, I think things are going good. I like to point those things out because, uh, there's a lot of negativity. It's so much. And you know how it is. You start talking to somebody and they're like, well, you don't know. I mean, it's, it's really hard, and you're like, I don't want to talk about this with you anymore because <laughs> yeah. it's a downer, you know? This doesn't improve any situation. But anyways, um, so I guess, as you may have guessed, this is kind of like just rapid-fire stuff. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, okay, have you have you experienced white privilege? Experienced white privilege. What I, does that I, mean to you as well? Um, I know what it means in the context in, in which people talk about it nowadays, uh, just being born white, thus your white privilege. It's, it's, it, that's the bottom line, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, as far as being in situations where I was favored over somebody of color, I haven't experienced that. You know, I, well, growing up in New Bedford, I mean, there was no way. Sure, sure. You know? Yeah. Um, I did, I, it really didn't occur to me where it was something that was happening and I felt like, holy shit, I would, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Was when I was uh, working in Midtown Manhattan, I worked for a clothing boutique and there was a woman that came in and I was an assistant manager in this clothing boutique. It was on the corner of 49th and 6th Avenue. I mean, literally in Rockefeller Center. It was very busy. And she came in and I was like, can I help you? You know, whatever. I'm pretty laid back about the whole thing. Um, and then, you know, bear in mind, culturally, it's very different over there than it is in California. It just is. Okay. Because it, it is very diverse. But this lady didn't want to have anything to do with me. And I, and, you know, and she was a black woman. And I felt like, what did I do wrong? Yeah. She just didn't want to deal with me. You know, I guess because it had something to do with how I looked or whatever. But they, most of my colleagues were of color and she said she'd rather be with them and that's fine. And then I asked, I talked to them about it. I was like, you know, she didn't want me to help her out. And she's like, well, they were like, yeah, well, you know, because she'd just rather talk to us. And I thought, 
all right, that's okay. And I really like had to think about it. And then it dawned on me. I was like, okay, going out into the world, I think that I am going to be perceived to be a certain way, you know? Yeah. And it would be in my best interest if I'm with people, especially, you know, with people of color. Yeah. To just be with them and to just pay close attention and listen to all of the things. Yeah. All of the minutiae of conversations and everything. Totally. You know? That's in other parts of the world. In the city of New Bedford, growing up, everybody was kind of the same. Yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't, we all had the same struggle. Sure. I have, it, it just, it just was what it was. Yeah. For that, then that part of my life, I mean, when you're from poverty, then it's not about privilege right. in a sense. But that doesn't matter. It's when I get old, when I'm older and I can intellectualize a lot of what's happening. It was just spending just that quality time and really paying attention and listening. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and yeah. so how it kind of translates in today being a white person in the world and what my responsibilities are, I have to stand up to other white people to kind of like shake them up a little bit. You know, you see these videos of white people calling out, you know, people who are not only of color, but you have some people who are Hispanic or speaking Spanish, you know, mm -hmm. you need to speak English or sure. that this whole go back to your country bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think about that stuff. Heaven forbid if a person who's white says go back to your country to somebody when I'm standing there. Sure. Because I will ream that person. Yeah. And that's a responsibility that I'm I'm happy to take on. Sure. You know, um, and it's important to have the conversations and to not feel like uh, awkward or strange or anything. I don't even, I don't feel that. It's like, it excites me. I wish I had more of these conversations with people. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. There's also this other predominant thing when somebody starts, I feel like when people start talking about white privilege and, to, and you start bringing it up to a white person, um, they may become a little bit on the like, defensive, mm -hmm. like they suddenly need to defend themselves mm -hmm. for some reason. And then that's when you know that that person just doesn't get it at all. Yeah. Because it's not about an individual it's 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 and it's nothing white people are to take personally mm -hmm. it is just a reality that needs to be embraced yeah and to ensure that everybody is being treated fairly and everybody is being accepted is the bottom line right and i think i think you hit it on the head there is people just need to be heard and understood mm-hmm that's really all it is. You don't need to do anything. You just listen and 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 be there when when you're needed to show up in in a, a fair way and treat people fairly. And if you see an opportunity to stand up for another human being, no matter the circumstance, if if they need a voice and you can be that voice, that's your only obligation. Just being aware of it. Oh, you, totally aware. You know. I actually learned something yesterday you know, at my workshop and we had three people there who were black and everybody else is kind of mixed, you know, and one of the guys was sitting there and, you know, it gets very emotional as actors in our emotions and, and with Meisner, you're treading in territory, which is going to like trigger something essentially will make you cry. That's the whole point of it. Sure. Get you angry. That's mm -hmm. the whole point of you. Make you laugh. That's the whole point of it. But it's dealing with a lot of personal experiences. And this one actor is talking and he said, you know, you know, being a black man and, you know, being raised, you know, with the culture, being black, I would learned early on not to cry, not to show my emotions even though I really, really wanted to. And like kind of like not being able to break down and cry and just holding my head up high no matter what. And I can't even begin to tell you how sad that made me feel 
because he was, then he went on to say that he was 38 years old and he was asked, when was the last time you cried? And he said, I was 11. For a young black man to be out in the world, not even feeling comfortable enough to cry, really takes my breath away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's, that's where my focus is at when it comes to things like privilege and people feeling comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. And I think um, a lot of black men come from the same traditional um, approach when it comes to their own masculinity or their own manhood. And I think a lot of that suppression can put them in some really dark places and they make some really bad decisions, which is so unfortunate. Um, I know somebody personally who's uh, experienced a huge turn of events and is now going to miss out on some really great things in their kid's life because of decisions made. And I, I honestly think that that, that position that the, that he's in comes from a life of suppression of not understanding how to cope and not having the tools or the resources or just the permission to feel all the pressure and let it go. And now they're in a situation that's almost irreversible. And you got to take ownership of your decisions and you, you know, you make the best of, of where you got yourself and, and do your very best to help anybody else that's going down the same or similar road. Um, yeah, it's just, it's so sad. And I, you know, I, I honor you for, you know, having that close to your heart. I'm the same way. I feel I'm mm-hmm. the same way. I'm, I'm looking for those opportunities to set people free because the reason we have mass shootings is we're not talking to each other. You know, we, yeah. we take drugs, we hide from one another and we end up feeling alone and, and scared. And that's where some of the worst decisions can be made, you know, so. <sighs> yeah, I know. Deep breath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a tough one. It really is tough, but I'm, I'm glad you said it the way you did. I think it's important. I think it's important to understand that, you it know, is. and I think personally, I'll own up to it. I didn't understand the validity of it. I just thought it was just angry people yelling angry things and no. wanted to just, but they have every right to feel, feel it out, mm-hmm. get it off your chest. The reason we love this country, even though some of us think we don't, is you have the freedom to believe what you want mm-hmm. and you can express it. There are countries where you can't say certain words. You can't <laughs> have certain beliefs. And if it's found out that you do, you could lose your life. That's absurd. But in this country, you can feel whatever you want. You can believe whatever you want. And I think we owe it to our fellow countrymen to just open the conversation up. Mm-hmm. Allow each other to feel those things. Don't try to fix anything that isn't your problem to fix. Right. Just, just be there for each other. The healing, the, the thought of the healing. Yes. The healing is it's actively taking place right now. And yes. I think, uh, if anything, we're in exciting times. We're actually in positive times, depending upon how you look at it, the glass being half full or half, dem- half empty. But it's, yeah, we're in a state of healing. The nation actually is in a state of healing. Agreed. And so, and that's a process. And I don't think things are coming apart at the seams at all. No. You know. We're evolving. Change is hard for people. Yeah. It's hard for people. Um, but people like yourself uh, and what I strive to, to do and be for others is, is a light in, in dark places. And just let people know, like, well, we're up against the same stuff, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? You want to talk about it? Let's talk about it. Yeah. That's that's the idea, right? <sighs> You're a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Gee, thanks. No, thank you. <sighs> In short, <laughs> this is going to be a little more controversial. That's all right. Oh, geez. <laughs> I'm not so politically um, educated. I don't know enough to have any real judgment on any part of politics. You know, I I like the freedoms I have. I think, yes, it's important for me to have some say in some things. And and I'm working on it. 
I am. I'm working on my own education. So, how do you feel about Trump? (laughs) (laughs) In short, you don't have to make it lengthy, but like, what is your experience so far? Um, well, I could tell you this. (sighs) When uh, I, my husband and I were watching the elections as things were unfolding and the numbers were suddenly coming out, you know, who's going to be the president of the United States? Um, <laughs> there's no way, yeah. you know, there's no way it's going to be Trump. It yeah. was like laughable, right? you know, and politically he and I are, we're more or less moderate to liberal. We, we tend to kind of, rather than be so quiet, quick to judge a person who comes from an opposing view. Again, it's just operating on tolerance and really listening to them and having an open mind. So I'll just leave it at that. But when that election went down that day and it hit us that he was going to be president of the United States, I remember standing, looking at the television. I remember what I was wearing, too. I was, was like, pretty... like you are. I was wearing home clothes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> you know, T-shirt and, like, sweatshirt, sweats, sure. comfy sneakers, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> I remember just crouching down and sitting on a step, and then I felt like this, um, almost like this panic and this fear uh, that my life has changed in that moment. Like everything that I knew to be what it was yeah. is now entirely different. Yeah. And I became very, very concerned for my friends and like my particular friend who, people who are Muslim, I became concerned for people who were politically a little bit more radical. I be- became concerned for people of color because I felt like when he became president, all of these folks who sort of like existing in the underbelly of America who are kind of feeling oppressed that, you know, that they can't exert their power like they did back in the day yeah. are all going to come for, to the forefront. And they did, you know. Yes. So I was, I was really scared. I think that Trump has... Um, He's backwards way of, of thinking, in a sense, and expressing himself. He feels he doesn't have any decorum or etiquette. He thinks that everything is a free-for-all. And if he was a person in the room, you know, filled with other people, you know, that might be funny in yeah. that setting. Yeah. But when you're the president of the United States, oh, man, I made me miss Obama so much. You sure. know, yeah, just, very just, polished. Just, then. just, just that alone. Yeah, and but everything else that has come with it, mm-hmm. um, the corruption, and also how again there are other people who feel like they are more apt or have given some kind of permission to flex. Yeah, yeah, like to you know, if anything, just uh, it's a certain generation, you know, sure. white. Yeah, to kind of like flex who they are and no things aren't going to change we are going to make america great again Mm -hmm. back when people like us were able to exert our power the way we did back then right and i don't agree with that yeah yeah it's a great way to put it so yeah i'm not i'm not a fan of him wow i'm not i um i mean growing up watching i remember when trump was just kind of like who he was in the 80s. You have like 80s Trump. Sure. You know, he was known for being a wealthy man. He was known for, you know, when it came to real estate, he was able to allocate real estate and build skyscrapers. And ooh, ah, everybody thought that that was impressed by that. Sure. But back then, we didn't know his story and where how he was raised and how he treated people along the way, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, and then, you know, I think he wrote a book called Take Names and Kick Ass or something like that. I'm not surprised, yeah. <laughs> Certainly a gimmick of his. He but is there's a this, yeah, there's this, uh, you know, it's just who he is. So, but I'm not, I'm, I don't know what he's like when he's, let's say, let's, let's imagine Trump 
sitting on the toilet taking a shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's going through his head? Yeah. Does he feel shame? Does he feel remorse? Sure. Is he thinking bad things? Is he panic stricken? Is yeah. he wishing he wasn't president? Is he, yeah. you know, what people think about when they're kind of caught up in that moment? Yeah. You know, you, you kind of have <laughs> deep thoughts. Yeah. How often does he sit there and say, how the fuck did I get to be president? <laughs> Like, does that happen? You know? Yeah, totally. And I'm with you. Like, I don't, I don't even, so it's just, and I'm not saying I want to cut the guy some slack. You know, he's apparently the most powerful person in the world, but I, I just, you know, I don't even know who I know who he is at his core. Yeah. I, I, it's like, I almost have to take a step back and just kind of like, well, whatever. But I don't want to throw words like hate out there because yeah. I'm, I don't want to exist and operate on hate. Yeah. I don't care, you know. Sure, sure. It, it just It just is. But I am deeply concerned um, for this time next year what our state of affairs is going to be like. Yeah. And um, when people talk about impeachment, I mean, it's a process. And, I mean, to impeach a president is to accuse a president of something. But the, the chips that fall after the fact, that, has, that remains to be seen. Right. And it doesn't happen overnight, as everybody knows. Yeah. Um, so I still think he will be president, uh, you know, come election time mm -hmm. next year. <sighs> Another four years with Trump really gets me thinking about options. <laughs> As far as what, moving? Yes. Yeah, I know. It is a little scary. <laughs> it's just, you know, thinking about options. And it's funny. My whole family is on the East Coast. I don't have any family out here. Like, okay. they're all up there. They're yeah. all over there. It makes me thinking about, like, okay, I want to batten down the hatches sure. and move back and be really close to the people that I love Good a idea. lot. Yeah. You know, like, it's it, it's that's a step, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I'm concerned, like, over the welfare uh, of human beings. Oh, bleak. I know. <laughs> That's interesting. I Yeah, I guess I think I actively choose to not think about that. Maybe because I already have family here, and I feel like uh, I'm still... I'll be one of the first to go, uh, embarrassingly. I'm not trained to do anything tactical. I, If uh, caught by surprise, <laughs> I can... I can scream like a, you know, like a young woman if um, pushed to the limits. I'm sure I, that would maybe give me some advantage in terms of being found by other people who can do, you know, have some survival skills. But uh, as far as Trump in the limelight and how he is, I think that's the thing about fame is that when you are in the public eye, you have a responsibility. You can't just do all the things you maybe doing your private time. You just you just can't. There are consequences, you know? And he thinks he's void of that. He doesn't really care. He's going to be him. There's something to be said about that, though, that he's just going to be himself. And however tainted his personality is, the idea that a man can take office being himself, that's kind of a cool idea. And, you know, hopefully we get the best out of this. But, yeah, what a mess. Yeah. What a what a visual mess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I like the way you put that. I love hearing people's take on it, you know, and you're very eloquent on how you put it and and careful not to to get caught up in in, you know, judgmental looking at Trump as a person, you're still willing to like give the guy a chance. If he showed up, you'd be like, "Hey, how's it going?" You I know. I just be like, "Hey, how's it going?" Uh it. I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> yeah. Have a seat. Yeah. Just, you know. <laughs> yeah. It'd be interesting. It'd be it'd be something else. Um, what are some good things you like about America? Well, that it's here. You know, when you look at just how America came to be in place and time. And how it actually, America being what it is, uh, transformed a lot of lives. And when you think of like evolution of the species, you know, it's yeah. interesting that 
uh, so many people have come to the United States and people are uh, you know marrying into families of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, you know, all of that. Um, it's a wonderful place in that there is freedom for people to be who they are, you know, number one, that we can exercise our faiths freely. Mm-hmm. Number two, um, I think that it holds a tremendous amount of promise as far as what decisions people are able to make for their themselves personally and how they want to achieve their dreams, whatever it may be. You know, maybe even the United States, I think now is like a, a springboard for people to move on to make better lives for themselves in other countries yeah. with the skill set that they were able to be educated in where they wouldn't normally have that opportunity for that level of education Mm -hmm. in a foreign country, you know? So it's fascinating. Um, I love, again, the diversity of people. I think it's wonderful, you know? Would you consider yourself patriotic? I am patriotic. Yeah. I'm patriotic in that I I love America and what it stands for. I, I love that I'm an American, uh, but I take caution because I know that things are, are changing in yeah. a sense. And I'm also respectful of the perceptions of other people who look at the United States and think like, we're all a bunch of crazy people right sure, about now. Sure. And you have to listen to them Yeah, and how they, they do. You're an American. So, you know, do you, do you have a gun? Do you own guns? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you, you know, like, like all of this stuff. Are you afraid yeah. to walk down the streets? Yeah. It's like... No, that was in New Bedford. Yeah. But it's <laughs> we're like we're all like Hollywood celebrities in their eyes. God, we all think we are rather. Um, well, that's good. I like that uh, that you see things that way. I I ask that question because I think sometimes people are not as patriotic as maybe they should be. I mean, you live in this country, you thrive here. You know, in in some respects. Um, it's just, it's hard to believe anybody would have anything negative to say about living here because, you, you know, you hear what it's like in other places and like it's, there's a lot of freedoms here that, you know, the rest of the world may not have. Everything is available to us. Yeah. You know, I remember, um, again, back in New York, I was working with a girl who was from the Dominican Republic and she said that she brought some of her family members who'd never been to the United States before. So we're having this conversation and, you know, I miss home, I miss my family and all this stuff. And uh, she says, yeah, my cousins, I took them to a grocery store. It was like kind of like a Whole Foods market type of grocery store in New York. And she said they started crying when they went into the produce section. Yeah. Because they couldn't believe just the the abundance and just the variety of food that was available. Yeah. They'd never seen that before. Wow. And I never forgot hearing about that yeah. and talking about that. Just on things like that alone. Yes. You know, it just makes you feel like, wow, Yeah, everything have, is here. Have you been to Mexico? I haven't been to Mexico yet. My husband wants to take us down, you know. I, I highly suggest driving through whatever you can handle. Drive through cities like Tijuana. Mm-hmm. Because just, you know, you think about state taxes, taxes in general in this country. You think they're taking my money, but you don't see what that money does right. until you go to a country that's not the same democracy. They don't, they're not built the same way. And you go by neighborhoods that half of, half of the, the scenery is, is like a landfill. And people have houses made out of old pallets and there's garbage everywhere and the streets are unfinished and there's, you know, hardly a police presence in some roads and there's poverty is much more normalized than it is here, but their homeless are working. Right. They're right. creatively trying to find a way to make a buck, make something. And they work for it. They make things. They clean things. They do things for the money. It's a little bit different from here where somebody's standing on a corner with a sign and they're not. there's no effort to try and earn that dollar. So just 
some really big differences in how how that society is. And I went to, we drove through Tijuana, went to, um, I can't remember what the the name of it was, but we drove through the, you know, the northern part of, of Mexico and just seeing the difference and then coming back. And just when you get into San Diego mm-hmm. and you stop at like a Walmart and you just walk into the Walmart and the difference between that and uh, maybe a, a, a kind of that kind of store in Mexico and the quality and product and the way that it's that it's run, the the environment of the parking lot, for crying out loud, just things are so underappreciated in in America yeah. that it's devastating to hear somebody from this country say anything negative about it. Yeah, it, looking at it from in that way, absolutely. I feel, yeah, and, and especially if you're somebody who was not, ha- when you were raised with like not having a lot and so you appreciate what it's available. Yeah. You know, it's in- what you said about the folks in Tijuana and places like that in the world where people are striving to just kind of find money so they could spend it on things, on their families, on food, or whatever it is that they need. Um, And then you look at the homeless in our country, and the first word that comes to mind is just like how lost our homeless population is. Yeah. And then you have people living in those same conditions, just as just like day to day, they're just one of the majority, this is how we live, are not lost. Yeah. So, uh, which proves our point that you when you have nothing just how lost you are yeah because everything is so available i don't know well it's when you when you see someone in the street especially somebody who's asleep passed out in some dark corner some dirty corner of some part of you know the city and you think to yourself if that were me if I woke up and there was nobody there for me and I was completely alone and even the people around me didn't acknowledge me, what what that would do to somebody, mm-hmm. you know, what that would do to a person. And it's it's disheartening to think that we have so much abundance here and yet we have that in our streets, you know, in a booming city like Sacramento, we, we have an, even an increasing issue with with homeless people. And those are kind of the signs that the system of things are screwy. Yeah, they are. Yeah. It's, it's the, the middle class is being, it's being squeezed in a way yeah. where it's extremely difficult for people to live without anxiety. Definitely. Over just obtaining means to an end. Agreed, yeah. And that's what's happening. And it's just, it, I feel like it's going to get worse. Yes, the pressure is on most definitely, and I think uh, I think a lot of what people deem as stress um, or maybe excessive stress, you get that just living here, just living in in a, in a modern city like Sacramento, let alone San Francisco, the stress of trying to maintain a lifestyle will will put you in in some really hard places in your mind and if you don't have the coping skills which is where mental health is you know super important and I think is the core issue in every part of our society is if we don't if we don't do something about mental health it will get worse and um I think it starts with the individual and you don't have to look at the problem in scale you start with you and if you if you treat yourself, um, you know, like a you keep yourself healthy and you do things, um, you know, you're kind to yourself and you're kind to the people around you. That's where it starts. And then that will trickle out. And I think that's how we can save the world is just by treating ourselves better, mm-hmm. treating people around us better. And those things, those issues will take care of themselves because we'll want to maintain that. You know, and I think that's where people get lost in all this. All the information is like, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> you know, well, take care of you. Just start with that. Yeah. If you're having an issue and we're out in public and we're in the same space and something's wrong. And I say, how's it going? Open up. I don't yeah. mind. Yeah. I don't mind. I got it. If you need to be heard out, let me. Somebody did it for me the other day. I was having a bad day at work and he says, how's it going? I'm like, meh. 
I'd rather not, rather not be doing this. I want to go do this or that. And he's like, hey, man, I get it, man. Work sucks. You want a Red Bull? Hell yeah, I'll take a Red Bull. And it was like, it made my day. It changed everything for me. Just that small moment. And that's, that's what I want people to do is just... Just relax. All those little things. Yeah. Yeah. Take care of yourself <laughs> and each other. Yeah. Um, well, we won't have to get into that. I was going to say, what are some things to improve with America? We, we've kind of already talked yeah, about that. Yeah, we kind of went into that a little yeah. bit. <laughs> uh, this is a random one. How do you think you would do in prison? Oh, man. Uh, if I was in prison, I feel I, like I've, know, I've known people who've been in prison, and so I... There's like a code of ethics that you abide by only just to kind of keep your sanity, if anything. Um, t- don't look at anybody. Don't talk to anybody to start. And then then in itself, that's a dead giveaway that, you know, you're new. <laughs> um, I think that I, I wouldn't have a problem eventually. I think maybe in the beginning it would be pretty <clears throat> tough based on the fact that I'm this scrawny person, you know. So I'd be targeted. She looks meek. She looks weak. Let's get her. Let's go get her. Yeah. You know? Like, come on over here. Who do you think you are? Like, in my face type of stuff to yeah. try to intimidate me and all that stuff. I could see all of that happening. Sure. You know? If anybody wants to throw punches, okay, let's do that too. <laughs> you know? I'll certainly lose in the fight, but at least I tried. Sure. And then in turn, hopefully gain some respect just by the fact that I was able to kind of mind my own. Right. And I know that in the prison world, people eventually figure out who you are. And if you're a weak person, if you're alpha, if you're a beta, all of that stuff comes to light. And it's really bottom line how mentally headstrong you are, yeah. you know, with yeah. what I've learned and people that I've talked to. Yeah. So I think I would be okay, okay. if somebody just doesn't want to, like, <laughs> knock me out so hard, <laughs> like, within my first day of being there, like, sure. poof, yeah. okay, she's dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That settles that. <laughs> okay. I don't think you, you know, I don't think you're ever, you know, put yourself in a position. You never know. Life is weird. I know. Things get crazy. I watch a lot of Dateline. That's the problem. <laughs> um, do you consider yourself mentally healthy? It depends on what day it is. Yeah. <laughs> I do because yeah. I'm very aware of what my problems are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, people who suffer from mental mental illness, when they've experienced things or they've come to the realization that they have things going on, things that they can't control, when you come to that realization and you're aware of it, then you can control it. You know, prone to depression growing up, um, just having some dark thoughts, you know, uh, you know, experience trauma here and there. So that sort of lends itself to more dark, dark thoughts. And you kind of feel like a little bit of, of PTSD as a result of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for people who experience mental illness. Um, I think that we all have had those extreme dark moments where you feel like all hope is lost sure and some of us are i think predisposed when you're in that you can't get out of it yeah now what you know yeah and it's it's chemistry it's genetics Mm -hmm. you know and i think that it's great that people are talking about it more it's still tricky because there is still a stigma attached sure. to it. Yes. Um, but I really, I, I love it when somebody says that they are dealing with this, that, and the other thing. I'm, I'm dealing with depression. I'm battling, you know, bipolar disorder. Um, I'm, I'm battling, you know, I have the tendency for schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a disposition that is this, that, and the other people talk about it and they put themselves on the line, you know, they get a tremendous amount of respect from me. And in a sense, you kind of salute them because you've had your own moments. What are, uh, what are some typical coping mechanisms that you have for like, if you start to feel depression come about, like what is something you do for yourself to alleviate? 
I love to exercise and I take a lot of fun in doing it. I used to run a lot. Um, I've cut back on that, but I'm in the gym four or five days a week and uh, I love exerting myself and putting in that, that physical energy because the endorphins that I get out of that are, it, it, it's worth it. I feel great afterward. Yeah. And I think that's what keeps me kind of in check it's just exercise, yeah. but all of us need to be doing that, yeah. exercising. So exercise is like the main go-to for sure. me. Do you ever feel the need to talk to somebody? And, oh, yeah. And do you have a handful of go-tos? I do. Okay. It's, it's what do you bring this up. One of the things I like to do, um, I have like a Marco Polo account. Okay. And because my family is so far away yeah, yeah. and with the time difference, it's hard to just sure. pick up the phone and call on my off hours because they're sleeping right. or vice versa, yeah. you know? So I will Marco Polo, my sister, you know, and yeah. just go on a rant. Yeah. And so she and her, in her time, yeah. when it's convenient for her, will listen and watch. And she really listens and watches the whole thing. <laughs> so Marco Polo is like a website. It's an app. An app. It's an app that you can put on your phone. And you can basically take, it's like a video of yourself talking to another person. Yeah. And it goes kind of like they receive a notification that they have a video waiting for them. They can watch of somebody talking to them. And then they can respond to it when it's convenient for them. So it's not like you're actively engaged sure, in a sure. conversation. You're just kind of allowing yourself to unload. Yeah, yeah. And then send it to that person. And so we go back and forth. And I, I love Marco That's really Polo. Cool. So there's that. Um, but yeah, I have some really great friends. Yeah. We all have similar things going on sure. with our acting career and, you know, life and relationships with family members and all this stuff where we just talk about it. Yeah. We, we call each other and, you know, yeah. we, we text each other. We spend time with each other. We talk about these things very openly and readily. You're very open about it. That was my... I am. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's healthy to me. I'm that kind of person myself. So, but I know a lot of people... And, and without, you know, harsh judgment on them aren't like that. They're not, they're very private and they work on their stuff, um, maybe in different ways. But I think sometimes there are the people who are in between who don't have coping mechanisms and, you know, may, may have struggles talking to other people. And, um, I personally think that, you know, even just psychotherapy is a great tool to have, but I also know through experience that, you got to find a, a doctor or a, a therapist that you have things in common with. And then it has to kind of be established like a friendship. Because if you don't have things in common with that person, it it, it almost feels uh, too distant for me. But I, I recently had met uh, a therapist that had a lot of things in common with me. And that just opened me up differently and then you know there were validations made and and how i thought things were going and you know things i tussle around with them this brain is always on there's always stuff shuffling around in there and I don't, I don't know what the driving issue is there but to have different ways to deal with stuff um you know people to talk to is is huge and i, I want i want to advocate that for people is that you know you can you can talk to each other and you know Hopefully you find someone you feel safe with. But yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so then uh, let's see. This segment, we're kind of, I'm kind of getting to an, an end here. I don't know how much time you have left, but um, I call it road rage. Road rage. Road rage, relative roads, road rage. And it's just like you to, an opportunity for you to either have like a, a PSA of your own or a pet peeve you have with literal traffic, you know, like get it off your chest. Yeah. 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 It's really funny. A pet peeve with literal traffic. Well, I, I mean, my pet peeve is, um, I, when I'm on the highway, I mean, granted I come from the level of driving, dealing in all elements, you know, yeah, rain, wind, snow, ice, everything Bay hurricane area. and mm -hmm. everything 
This is in New England. Oh, wow. Where I learned how to drive. And I learned how to drive on a stick shift. And so I oh. I know how to get out of the snow. I know how to... There's You're, you're dealing with uh, coming from a, an area where it's highly populated and densely populated to the point where you, when you look at the roads, you got to follow the goddamn rules <laughs> in order to get where you need to go. Okay? So... I come from a region where people are rule followers, and then I come to California, and it's a free for all. Why the hell <laughs> do people want to pass on the right all the time? Yeah. Why is it that people feel like they need to drive their comfortable sixty-five miles an hour in what would essentially be the passing lane? Don't do that. Yeah. Get the hell out of the way so somebody <laughs> can go around you. So I, you know, especially on, it's on the highway when you're kind of barreling through. And so I'm used to sitting in the travel lane, going the speed limit or a little bit higher is what I would do sure. back east. You know, if you're in the left lane, the right lane, it's because you're driving very slowly. If you're in the left lane, it's because you're speeding and you just want to pass. Yeah. So when you go to New England, let's say you get on the Mass Pike, it's mind-blowing when you see how fast people are going in the left lane, yeah. and they stay there. Yeah. And then people pass in the left lane, yeah. and the middle lane is so comfortable, you can literally drive across the state and not have to worry about some butthole coming up on you yeah. on your right side, because they see a, an open space. It's like they want to take that and just boom, pass you on the right and cut in front of you. It, it, it and there's so many state troopers on the highways yeah. um, in New England and you know New Jersey that yeah. you can't get away with that kind of driving uh, behavior. Nice. Where is the CHP? I yeah. never see them. Yeah, and they, end of the month. They just they're like where do you, where, what the hell? So <laughs> that's like one pet peeve, and, and people not using we call them uh, directionals back east sure i think you call them turn signals here in the cars <laughs> nobody yeah. uses them it's like i'm just gonna slow down and yeah yeah come to a rolling yeah. stop and take a right turn yeah and yeah it's yeah like, let them have it what the hell come Bastards. on just you know so yeah they're they're all um yeah i could i could say some really mean things about you know you sure. should, people have kids in their car i know don't drive like an idiot i know <laughs> I get it. And and, the, and I've, I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again. It is the merger's responsibility to either speed up to the pace of traffic mm -hmm. or slow down and get in the lane. Zipper effect. Zipper effect. That's what they call it in the in uh, other foreign countries, like in Germany. I've heard that. Yeah, the zipper effect. You don't try to cut or get, you just don't. You just yeah. figure out a way to blend in yeah. like you're closing a zipper but you know some people just don't have the patience and they just want to get in there oh and God. they want to cut you off you know and it's like well and what ends up happening is that they usually get stuck behind somebody and you end up passing them anyway <laughs> yes yeah they, they get squeezed out onto the shoulder it's like well you're a fucking idiot anyways yeah those are good moments. Yeah. To so some degree. I don't want to hurt anybody to get hurt, but No. If they're so and they're so stupid, sometimes I'll slow down because I get it. It's tough to to get in there, especially if it's a short merge. Like I, I get it and I'll slow down. They'll slow down. No. Speed <laughs> up. Forget it. You're done. You're lost. Goodbye. And then they I see them in the rearview mirror off one of those shoulder and it's like, well, you deserve that. There's a um you have uh uh, they're roundabouts. Yes. You know, I lived in England for a time. So, so you know what, you know, when you have those, there are some of them in new England too, especially as you get onto Cape Cod, they're called rotaries okay. in Massachusetts, but they're big. Yeah. And so there's the whole like learning how to blend and merge and getting into like a merging situation. I mean, if you know what you're doing, it's really handy when you find yeah. yourself confronted with, a rotary because people don't know do you wait until all the cars yeah. go yeah. it's like no, no you just get on there with them yeah and then blend in and just be aware of what you're doing and use your damn signal use your signal yeah. you know on the cape on cape cod 
on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Uh, so you have people <laughs> get to the Rotary who are visiting, you know, yeah, yeah. vacationing. Oh, dear. Like, like, oh, look at this. This is a rotary. I know how to do this. I did this in the UK. Yeah. You know, they just get on there and they go around. But then there are some people who are like, what the hell do I do? So they yeah. just come to a stop. Right, right. And so then you have this traffic backup on, on the Cape that's just ridiculous. Yeah. And it, it doesn't need to be that way, but it just is. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, something else that I always thought was kind of interesting is just like merging and inability to merge and yeah. not caring. And I think it's, it's underappreciated at the DMV. They need to really push that in the testing is for people to understand merging. We would have less traffic issues if it was a, a much more understood process. I remember, uh, speaking of roundabouts, I lived, when I lived in England, we went to a show in Milton Keynes and Milton Keynes is known for its numerous roundabouts, and everything looks the same. And it's dark and dreary England, so it's like a nightmare, like a, a you know a Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> and I remember one night, I must have been stuck in those roundabouts, like five or six roundabouts, and I would go around and round. And I'd get off, I'd go to another roundabout, and go around, and I'd see a sign that I already saw like half an hour ago. Oh, dear, it was. <laughs> I'm sorry for anybody that was out there while I was out there because I must have caused some problems. But <laughs> anyways, got that off my chest. Well, thank you, Corinne. Oh, no, thank you. Yeah. It's been great, you know, just kind of talking about these things and having an opportunity to talk, knowing, you know, that maybe there'll be a, a captive audience <laughs> somewhere <laughs> listening. Yeah. But um, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Well, everyone I ever meet goes here in this book. And now I met you, and you're going in the 